1 Timothy. Chapter 2, verse 8, and then going into chapter 3 through verse 7. I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. Likewise also that women should adorn themselves in in respectable apparel, with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders, so that he may not fall into disgrace, into the snare of the devil. All right, here we go. Now, last week we looked in the context, and we're going to be going back into between chapters 2 and 3 for the next few weeks. Uh, maybe even more, um, as we continue to put the context together and show the tone and the purpose for which Paul's writing. You have to remember, in every sense, when you read the Bible, we aren't to say, that verse means this. That's an error. Unless we know that the letter is teaching this, and in that context, the verse means this. Never is there ever an exposition with a myopic verse. That's called eisegesis. That's where we read into the text. Exegesis means we take out of the text what the text is saying. And that always, always comes with context. So in other words, the way we're taught to read the Bible with verse and chapters, etc., is often a misapplication of good learning. And in doing so, we create all sorts of philosophies and all sorts of ideas and things that breed and promote speculations rather than, as Paul has already said, that which regards the stewardship from God that is by faith. So as we read this today, we need to keep in mind what Paul is doing. He's writing the elder of Ephesus, commanding the elder of Ephesus, thus those elders behind Timothy and today still learn what our job is and what our calling is by the teaching of Paul to Timothy and also to Titus. And then we see then the commands through other letters like Hebrews and Romans and other places like that where Paul will instruct the church on how they are to relate to the elders. And with all of this together, we get a perfect job description. But why does Paul do this? Is Paul not writing Timothy because of false teaching? Well, he tells us why he's doing this. I write these things so that you may, what, put in order, so that you may make things right, so that you may, what, learn how the church ought to behave. There's a paraphrase for you. So in the context of all sorts of disorganization, all sorts of hubris, all sorts of puffed up knowledge, all sorts of confident assertions, all sorts of theological debates, Paul writes the letter to the elder of the churches of the whole city who says, this is what I'm telling you to do. Charge them to stop saying, teach them what is right. Now I'm going to show you what an orderly church looks like. That's as much time as Paul spent on the matter of false teaching. Now, he'll talk about it more over here, but he uses it as a thread that runs through. What Paul is doing is saying that the people of Christ are humble people. Why? Because Christ is the prime example. What does Peter say? Though Christ was what? Though Christ was hurt and deriled and everything else, he did not return that with the same attitude, the same desire, but yet he entrusted himself to the one as faithful. 
He entrusted himself to the Father. He did what was required of him in submission and humility to the Lord, to the Father, to God the Father. And this is God the Son, the creator of the cosmos, who's submitting himself to become an object of wrath in the place of another people, that is the elect of God. And so we're learning. Don't forget when Paul is teaching this, he's showing Timothy what a humble display of God's gracious character in the lives of his people really looks like. And it's not just here, it's everywhere. We go to Galatia, we see that. We go to Thessalonica, we see that. We go to Corinth, we see that. We see the instruction everywhere we go in the New Testament. So for the saints, you realize that the New Testament letters are not evangelistic in their purpose. They are instructive, they are didactic, they are to teach the church something. So elders then, according to Paul's letter to the elders, are to teach the church something. Not just theological things, but the so what now that the theological things are there. Okay, God is and God requires, now what? Then we put these things into the right perspective so that we will be known and that we will live as a people of humility and a people of orderly lives, especially among the assembly. assembly. And so when Paul writes this letter, there are a lot of things that are taught for the elders to command and instruct and teach and build. Well, I'm going to use that, church, that word there, but, but grow the church in its building of itself. And it's all about the assembly. It's all about the gathering. It's not how the church ought to operate out here in the, in the world, but yet we see some of that instruction in it. We're not showing, uh, Paul's not telling how things ought to happen at Walgreens or at work or at school. We see that teaching elsewhere, but Paul is teaching the elders of the church of what the church ought to look like when it comes together. How the church and its order displays the gospel that even the creation showed. And we saw some of that last week and the week before. So God's people display His gracious character, His humility, God the Son's humility. And how is it that we do that? This is a review. By grace, through His salvation that He's given us in Christ alone because of the imputed righteousness that is ours, that we are taught by God, we are instructed by the apostles, and now we are learning that we are watched over and cared for by the elders. So see, there's no break in the chain. Though the elder may be the highest office in the church, it's the first slave. Paul, the greatest calling of any person in the world to be an apostle of Christ, yet it was the most humble place. Many times where Paul even had the authority to say, I'm going to come down there. It is my right as an apostle. I'm going to deal with this in a way that I could in a godly way, but because of God's mercy for me, the chief sinner, I'm going to treat you with greater gentleness. I'm going to treat you with greater gentleness. And so we've learned last week that not all men are, have the authority to teach the church. And women don't have authority to teach the church. And in this context, it is about the what? It is about the assembly. It is about teaching the church what they ought to know and then holding them accountable for what they ought to know and do in the context of the assembly. It has nothing to do with the home, has nothing to do with the work, has nothing to do with the schools, has nothing to do with anything else. It has everything to do. There's nothing, there's nothing in the instruction of the scripture that takes women out of leadership, even in the church or even in the home or even in the community. It's just talking about the assembly. Just like with elders, we're going to learn this morning, what is an elder? What does he do? What, what, is his, what is his purpose? What is his qualification? Why? Why would we need to learn that? Why does this letter to the elders even need to be read to the church? Because that was the instruction of the apostles. Read the letters to the church so that, that you may know. Don't take my word for what I tell you my job is. Don't take the elders of this church at their word. We could make it say and do what we want it to say and do, right? I could just... Because I have this platform, I could just come up with all sorts of creative arguments that sound plausible that you would go, yeah, that sounds right. All right, amen. We could say amen, but yet it's not what God's word says. Beloved, we live in a, in a society, in a Christian society, historically, that has done that over and over and over again. That we have, we have come up with all sorts of beliefs that are not necessarily from the Bible, even though they are claimed to be biblical. And so men are not allowed to be elders just because they're men. 
Women are not permitted to be elders and do not have the calling. Only elders have the calling and only elders are qualified to teach the church. Now think about that for a second. That's what Paul's arguing here. That's why in the very next breath of chapter 3, he says the saying is trustworthy. He's talking about order in the church in the context of false teaching because what happens? What happens? I mean, look at our world. Imagine if God had provided Paul just a a 30-minute glimpse at social media through a vision. Paul would have died. (laughs) What is this? What is this? I mean, I had the knowledge, uh, the, the privilege of knowing great grandparents and great aunts and uncles. It was, it was wonderful to have the influence of people in their 90s and upwards to triple digits in my life for so long. And I'll, I'll never forget all the times where I would visit those people. And after a few months, you know, of, vi- of not visiting, you go in, you visit, and they always said something about how the world was so different. It's changed so much in the last three months. And I thought, that's odd. Still hot, still gnats. I'm still in school. You know, that kind of stuff. That changed for me. But as I age, I begin to see what they, what they say. That the world in its technology, the world in its ideology, the world in its rapid philosophical realities, it, it, it just leaves us behind if we're not really in it. And so sometimes it begins to make us feel like we're just, we're somewhere, we're somewhere else. But beloved, I'm going to tell you this. If we really focus on getting our understanding of the faith from the Bible itself, we also will feel like we're being left behind. And in the world, as we see Paul teach in 1 Corinthians, what did he say? There was a real, it's, it's every generation feels this way. Every generation. And if you really want to look at the sophists and the philosophers of antiquity, beloved, we're stupid <laughs> in comparison. I mean, you know, talking about highbrow discussions, a what? We're just not the same. We don't think the same way. It doesn't mean we're dumb. It's just in comparison to that subject matter, we don't know. We're ignorant. But that was happening in Corinth. And what does Paul say? It's not about the wise people. It's not about the soothsayers. It's not about the, 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 you know, the, the philosophers or the debaters of the age. Where are these people? They're nothing. Christ in simplicity, the God of all truth. He is the most, he is, the, he is God, he is the highest of all things. So here is God in human flesh walking upon the earth that he created so that he could reveal himself to his people divinely in a way that it seems so silly. That's the foolishness of the cross, the folly of the gospel, the story of the good report of the Redeemer, Jesus the Christ, Messiah, Mashiach, whatever word or language you want to put it in. This is the holy anointed one of God who has been sent by the Father to do the work of redeeming His people alone by grace. And it is not something that we can obtain. It is something that God grants us. Repentance is the granting of faith in Jesus Christ. It's a change of disposition. The new birth is what God does to see secure his people in the redemption that he has already accomplished. Think about that. For a second. And this is just John's gospel, which is why I get really animated because it's what I live for. But this is the gospel. And now because the gospel is what it is, Paul is writing these things and he's saying there's order in the church. And now he's going to show what the slaves and the leaders of the slaves look like. And that is the elders of the church. The word episkopos, sometimes presbyteros, it doesn't matter. It's where we get episcopal and, 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 and presbyterian. In the polity or the government of how the congregations operate. But it literally means two things in the context of Scripture. The context, not the definition of the word, defines what is being said. In the context of the Scripture, in two ways, the word elder is used, or overseer, same word. It's an older person, someone older than you is an elder. So if you're 20 and a person's 30, that person's an elder in time. Okay? And then the office. The office. And there are two offices in the church. People who serve in a particular capacity with certain instructions, certain commands, and certain authority. And then a very strict and simple job description of what they should do. And that's what the second one is. An overseer. Someone who looks after or looks over the care of the church. And a lot of people say, well, care is visiting the sick. Hmm? Not necessarily. 
Care is making sure the sick are visited. Care is doing this. Well, not necessarily. Care is making sure that this is done. And our world has ruined. I mean, here we are. I personally have been in the ministry full-time as a pastor, 23 years. And I can, I can write horror stories in books on how I have been called in in disciplinary meetings because I didn't go to football games when it's 95 degrees outside and Nats. I'm not going to a football game in that. I don't care if my kid's playing. Hey, have a good time, son. <laughs> Dad's going to stay in the air conditioner. Oh, now if you really love the Lord, you've got to go to football games. But that's what Virginia football is all about. If you lived in Athens, it's probably the same way. I've been rebuked because I didn't, my Bible study in a middle school that I had one time wasn't big enough. I had 63 kids in that study on Friday mornings that I took out of my day to go and do. And um, it wasn't big enough because another, another school had a bigger Bible study. So I was reprimanded. I'm like, can somebody just tell me what I'm supposed to be doing? What should I eat for breakfast? I was a little smart aleck at that time. Let me write. Wheaties or Frosted Flakes? You know, that's not how you handle stuff like that. That's not humility. But this letter was written to one elder, thus all elders can learn from its prescription. And the church learns and listens to the word of God and then watches and obeys the elders according to the word of God. And when should we obey the elders? I don't know. When should wives submit to their husbands? When should the church submit to Christ? Now this is tough. Because the word submit in and of itself is negative in our, in our culture. It's the connotation of submission, the connotation of humility makes men feel weak. Remember last week when I was talking about you know, the, the bandolier Bible study, prayer meetings. Just put our waffles in the air. Thank you, Jesus. I mean, we're coming. We're charging the gates of hell, and we're ready to do it. No, it's about humble submission and learning quietly for all of us, myself included. In all circumstances related to the assembly and relationships therein, the sheep of Christ, the body of Christ, of which I'm a part of, by the way, uh, must submit to the leadership of the elders according to the Scripture. In all matters relating to the public reputation of the church, the sheep should submit to the leadership and the oversight of the elders. In all matters regarding to what God's word affords that authority, this is order. A church without qualified elders is not a church, it's out of order. A sheep without a qualified body is out of order. A an elder without a qualified flock is out of order. These things are not existent. It's like I'm a husband, but I've never been married. Yeah, I got a wife. Who is she? Don't know yet. <laughs> I mean, that's silly, right? Paul tells Timothy that in the face of division, frustration, and the like, that order is the special of the day. Order is the prescribed menu. And that's what he's teaching. That's what he's teaching. The saying is trustworthy. When Paul writes to Titus, he says, I left you in Crete that you may put in order that which remained. By how? He didn't give him a list of things to do. Appointing leadership teams and committees and develops, develop, develop all sorts of things and ministries. He said, no, by appointing elders in every city. And Paul, of course, taught him the same thing he's teaching Timothy or reminding Timothy. Timothy didn't just learn this. Oh, wow, I didn't know. No, he's reminding Timothy of the things he already knows that this is what an elder must be, and this is why. So elders put in order that which is out of order. Elders keep in order that which is brought out of order. The sheep must be in order. See, that idea doesn't, don't you hear it? Don't you feel it, the Gestapo? Don't you feel the, the oppression? Don't you feel oppressed here at Grace Truth Church? Don't you feel manipulated and, and pressured? Don't I beat this pulpit and water hose you down good with holy fire every few weeks so that you feel guilty enough to keep coming back? No, that's not how we, that's not how we do it. That's ungodly and that's unbiblical. I can get animated, but it's because I'm an excited, animated type person when I'm in public. When I'm in private, I cry to myself. I mean, you know, we don't, we don't do, uh, it, it, it's not about 
power and strength and, and keeping people doing what you say they must be doing. It's about leading. Order is about presenting a picture. The marriage is a picture of Christ in the church. The church is a greater picture of an internal reality of Christ and his people because that's what it is. You know, it's not. And on this earth, the family units and the individuals that make up the church, we work together to display the gospel in a way that God alone in his wisdom, which is absolutely ridiculous in, in, in logical sense, but in his wisdom he has established, this is how I want to show myself through my people. That by the church, in the display of the church, his manifold wisdom is, 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 is revealed. So the sheep must be in order, thus the elder must be in order. The elders are not alone. There must be more than just an elder. We have to work toward those things in a church that doesn't have more than one qualified man who is ready. And not only is the elder not alone because he needs other elders, the elder's wife and family are part of his life. And then the deacons and their families are part of the life of the church. And those who refuse any part of the order and instruction at any, any given time are to be corrected. And if they're unwilling to listen, they're to be put out of the church to keep order. We don't keep fighting. We just put the people who aren't willing to sit down and say, listen, Jesus says, sit at his feet and listen. Like Mary, who chose the greater thing. And if Christ commands that of his people, and, those, and there are certain people who claim to be his who refuse that instruction... We don't have to continue to carry that fire and garbage inside of our family, inside of our household. We are able to say, until you get straight, you are going to go. But those who are put out can return once they submit in humility to the order of Christ. Then the flock is back in order when we put people out of the church. Those who put out, they lose their voice, they lose their opinion, they lose their influence, they lose their intimacy, they lose their friendships, they lose the benefits of the body. And the flock receives them fully and gladly when they come back. People who refuse the assembly are not going to receive the ministry of the body. Other times when you can't, be in the assembly. That's different. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of elder, chapter 3, he desires a noble task. He desires a noble task. So right here we see that a qualified elder must be called. He must desire it. It's not like one of these, I heard this from a, a mentor years ago, mama called and daddy sent. And that's like, oh look at my little preacher and when he turns 18, get out of my house, that kind of thing. Yeah, that's, that's not what it's all about, a calling. This implies, first, that he's born of the Holy Spirit, that he is truly a believer. And that means he understands the grace of God. He understands the mercy and the authority of Christ. He understands the sufficiency and the authority of the Word of God. Without this, no man, no elder, is worth his weight in eggshells, much less salt. Salt's pretty valuable now. He understands he is a redeemed sinner. He has no ground for boasting. He's no better than anyone else. He's not a leader by suggestion or authority, but by calling. And that call is defined by God alone. An elder is not supposed to follow after culture or history, not follow mom and daddy, grandmama, not tradition, not the church. He is to follow Christ only by God's word. This call is very costly, and sometimes it is very thankless, but he cannot do anything else. That's what a call is. I remember one foot in the ministry, one foot in the world. And when I say the world, I meant vocation. And I remember that struggle of talking to pastor after pastor. You know, I'm teaching, I'm serving, I'm finding myself, you know, it's, it's 80 to 90 hour weeks because you're doing all of it. And you talk to people and they go, well, I had one guy. Well, that's what, I praise the Lord, pulls out a seminary application with his name at the top of it. Just submit this and you'll be a pastor. Nah, that's not, that's not that person. And I had one person give me good advice. He says, do not go into the ministry as a pastor. Whatever you can do, fight it. Stay away. Don't do it. I'm like, that's rude. But then all of a sudden I realized, I can't do anything else. I have 
to invest in God's people. I can't not do this. And I'm willing, to, I'm willing at all costs to do it. I don't care what it costs me. It's got to be done. You see? And that's my story. That may not be yours. But for years, the work of oversight, the work of teaching, the work of investing was happening. And then someone finally said, brother, husband, go answer the call. And that was my wife. This call, this call of the pastor is something that someone aspires to, and it is a noble task. Noble. That word emphasizes a lot of things. It emphasizes that that it's a spiritual task, and the life of the elder must be spiritual. He must have a servant's heart. We can go through all the texts of Scripture, but for, for, for time's sake, we don't have, you, just, you don't have to trust me. Just look it up. Just go in and look and see what all Paul teaches about the, the person and the character of those overseers, of himself, of then Christ. A servant's heart. He has a desire to give himself away for the sake of others. A full love of God's people at any cause. A desire to show Christ to all that he meets. A desire to be least among men. A desire to live and even die for the sheep. And the calling is a divine gift of simple understanding of God's word through study. Which, in, which gives a ceaseless passion for the word itself. The call, the noble task, is teaching the church to do the work of the ministry by equipping them through that teaching. The pastor, the elder, has a mind that continually centers on these things in the midst of every season, as we'll see in the second letter, in season and out of season, insist, command, rebuke, with all authority, instruct, for the word of God is sufficient for these things, and you, Timothy, will be successful. We, we, we saw that a little bit last week. And I believe that, as another mentor told me a long time ago, he says, a man ain't worth paying what he won't do for free. That in the context of the calling of the ministry in the office of deacon and the office of elder, those brothers who do that will be serving in that capacity in some sense in the work long before they're ever affirmed in the office. Because that's what a calling does. It's also a call to oversee. The overseer. This noble task. What in the world does it mean to oversee? Just what it says. To look after. To care for. There's a lot of Greek in here. A lot of Greek words that aren't necessary. You can can pull it out in the English if you want. But let's look at this list. It must be above reproach. A one woman man. That's what literal translation would be. The the, the sober minded. Self controlled. Respectable. Hospitable. Able to teach. Not drunk not violent, gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money, managing his household and his children submissive. Must not be a recent convert. He must be well thought of by the community. Let's go through those. Why? Because you need to know. You need to know what it means to have the character required to lead God's people. Now, the cool thing about it is, is I can go through the New Testament and I can find the same instruction to the sheep of Christ, to the general chair sitter, as I can the elder. So everything that the elder is called to be, every church member is also called to be. Above reproach. What does this mean? Free from any charge? Free from... Any of the following requirements, a charge of being called out that that these things are not matching the man standing in the office of elder. As Paul would tell the church of Ephesus, these things should not be counted among you, should not even be known among you. These types of things, you can't be known for these things, be above reproach. He must be known for fleshly things in the sense that the world could, could easily say, That guy's a pastor? You know what I'm talking about. Some people maybe even come to mind. 
And though it may be haute couture to curse and swear in the pulpit, it is so unbecoming of a man called of God. Why? Because it offends the senses of many people. And it's not beneficial. Do pastors curse? You better believe it. Husband of one wife. Little translation. A one woman man. Now, oh goodness, here's one of these things where people take that verse and they build an entire theology out of that verse. Oh, you know, it's about polygamy, it's about divorce, and there's a lot of conversations that could be had. But in the sense that Paul is saying here, there's order. A one-woman man means devoted, devoted, devoted to his spouse. So how many times have I been disqualified in my spirit and even my actions in that context. Have I loved my wife as Christ of the church every single second of my day? Absolutely not. I had to give the pause there. Absolutely not. It is specifically say, saying here that all husbands are to love their wives as Christ of the church. The elder must reveal this. The elder must strive in this way. The elder must understand this. His wife can't be under his thumb, and he can't be under hers. He can't neglect his family, his, his marriage, for the sake of investing in everybody else. There's a problem. Because sometimes the church requires it of a man. And the only answer to that, well, your wife ought to do something to. The wife of the elder must be the center of his focus and not an afterthought. According to the commands of Christ, within reason, his marriage must be sound and working to reconciliation in every sense. If a man could care less about his wife, he will care even less about the flock of Christ. This is not perfection, but pressing purpose to be devoted to his spouse. That's what Paul's saying. Sober-minded. One who controls their emotions and their mouths. James even says that to the saints at large, doesn't he? Watch out with your mouth, boy. It's like a rudder of a ship. That little teeny tiny thing turns a big ship. That little teeny tiny spark sets the whole world on fire. Such is the mouth. Sober-mindedness is often out of the overflow of the heart the mouth speaks. Sober-mindedness deals with emotions. My dad used to say, don't let your mouth write a check your butt can't cash, son. Being led by the Spirit and the Word versus led by the flesh and the emotions, passions, zeals, and attitudes. Emotions are true and real. I have them. I share them with you. I share a small little picture of the turmoil that I have sometimes in my life, of the suffering, of the stress, of the aggravation, of the anger even. But being sober-minded is to sit down and to rest these things and not act out according to our desires, but live according to the Spirit and the Word of God. And it's very difficult to do. It's like my father used to always say when he worked with the Bureau and the Sheriff's Department all those years. And, and he say a lot of times the fear of the penitentiary keeps a lot of men honest. The fear of hurting you sometimes is a very clear and present danger that God uses. That you're really going to destroy the sheep for your own desires. Shut your mouth. <laughs> you know, now God doesn't talk to me that way. I haven't read that in his word. The spirit of God brings to mind those realities. An elder must be a self-controlled man. This deals with what is good, sound, and right judgment in all circumstances. A self-controlled person is not carried along by the crowd. A self-controlled person has good common sense on the matters of life. A self-controlled person, in the context of the elder, is led by the Spirit of God, who works this into him so that he doesn't make a mess of God's people. Because if I make a mess of my life, after all, most people, what? Look to the pastor for everything. 
What should I do about this? I mean, I even had people come up to me one time with a rash on their arm. What should I do with this? And I go to the doctor. <laughs> That's what you should do with it. I'm not, and I'm a, I have horrible phobias of fungus. I don't want to touch that. I'm not even gonna lay hands on that person. You know what I'm saying? And I'm all jokes aside. Yeah, I don't know. It's okay if you want me to look at it, but I know more. I don't know as much as anybody else in the room about that kind of stuff. I've been an accountant. I've been a lawyer. I've been a general contractor. But I can't do any of those things. But that's people come to me. Hey, can you help me with this? Can you help me with that? Can you? I, I, well, let's look it up. <laughs> you know. Imagine. Because that is the case, if, if elders are not self-controlled, they make a mess out of that wisdom. They are constantly just running into walls and just giving flipping advice. A self-controlled person doesn't run his mouth and act out and fail in his service. He doesn't ruin his own life and bring others down with him. But the Lord is faithful to God. I confess my me- to God me and to God other elders. I confess my messes. It isn't that I don't feel and think messy things. It's that God helps us to learn and to lead others to do what is right, to do what is profitable, and to do what is beneficial, no matter what. And for those of you who've known me a while, you know how many times I've said punch in the throat. (laughs) It's been a long time since I've punched somebody in the throat in anger. But for those of you who have taken Kung Fu with me, Uh, Fair game. Respectable. Is the life and the character of the man in order or in chaos? Now, I feel like my life is constantly in chaos. Don't you? Not for me, but for you. Isn't there a time where you think, am I ever going to get some peace? Well, may not. But to be respectable is to be in order. All life to me is chaos especially when many people are involved, but can the elder, can the man manage the chaos and make order and peace in the midst of it? Does he have a a handle on how to bring solutions? Is he respectable? Is he responsible? Is he orderly? Because this is directly related to how he can manage the Lord's teaching of his people. An elder must be hospitable. We've ruined ourselves with the, with the, uh, you know, the Florida resorts. It's the hospitality suite. Oh yeah, what's that mean for an extra five thousand dollars today? You can eat free. Wow, let's do it. And it's like snack crackers, canned sodas. <laughs> hospitality in our world means laying out the table, rolling out the carpet putting on the service thing, a little bow tie, saying, come on in, take over my life, have all that I have, it's yours, eat, drink, and be merry. That's nothing to do with it. It's not about fellowship at all. Hospitality has nothing to do with fellowship, has nothing to do with hanging out, has nothing to do with eating. The word literally means a lover of all people without favoritism. James even talks about that, right? This has nothing to do with having people over for dinner. That is a matter of desire and a matter of self-control and what is profitable and good and fits the obligation and, most importantly, the occasion. This has nothing to do with fellowship and community. The pastors of the church have to spend time with their families more than most of us because we are called out more often. It has to be scheduled. It has to be focused. It has to be orderly. There's nothing flippant, like, hey, what do you want to do today? That doesn't happen in my house. Somebody calls on Saturday morning, hey, you want to go do this? Probably not, because I already have a whole schedule of getting things I've got to do. I've got to pet the dog, and I've got to water the flowers, and I've got to, like, hug one child at three and the other child at four and (laughs) slap one of them at the back of the head, get it straight, hug him 30 minutes later. I mean, I'm being... Ridiculous. We have to spend time together to answer the strict focus and command of God to equip the future elders of the church as well. 
You realize that's a direct command to the elders is to equip other men to continue the lineage of elders. Believe it or not, there's no biblical mandate for a pastoral search committee. Tell you what, let's let the business leaders who pay people nothing to do everything find the next leader. You know what? That ain't the way it works. And then let's hold them under the fire until they quit or get fired. What in the world? A pastor must be kind to all people. That's what it means to be hospitable. A pastor must be able to equip the men and the women of the church without respect of persons. Even lost people. Even unbelievers. A pastor must be kind to them to do the work of the evangelist. And he must be on par to continue to do the work of the church itself by enabling and equipping the church to actually do it. Church members do not own the pastor's time and ministry under the charge of hospitality. It is wide and deep, but it must be balanced and focused, respectable and self-controlled. A pastor must have friendliness toward his community, and he must care for it. Not just the body, but the community. I mean, my wife can tell you how many times a month our doorbell is rung by somebody that is not a member of this church, nor attends it. Because I didn't get my thousand acres. <laughs> I got my two acres. And my door's 25 feet from the street. <laughs> it's just the nature of the call. He must be able to teach. And I'm going to talk about this more in depth later. A whole sermon on the teaching of Scripture, what it means and how it's done and how to understand it. This is a must. If a man is an elder and he cannot teach or will not teach, he is disqualified. Now, teaching is not necessarily... I've been doing public speaking for a long time. It's just one of those things. It's not about eloquence. It's not about demeanor. It's not about the ability to persuade. It's not about any of this kind of stuff with all these other knuckleheaded big mega church pastors that like to tell everybody else how they did it, which gives God no credit. I'm talking about just being able to teach. Listen to the Word of God. Read the Word of God. Live out the Word of God. Apply the Word of God. And then instruct other people in it. It's not about Greek or outlines or alliteration or, you know, PowerPoint presentations. I can teach with a PowerPoint. I do it about 400 slides for a one-hour sermon. No kidding. It moves, and it's fun. But it's 20 hours a week to put the slide together. You, know. you save those for conferences that aren't about Scripture. The teaching of the elder is a gift of God so that the church can apply the Bible in every sense to every circumstance. And the most amazing thing is that we have to be learners long before we're teachers. And then while we're teachers, we have to continue to be adamant learners. An elder cannot be drunk. <laughs> Not a drunkard. It doesn't mean that he cannot drink. Paul tells Timothy... To drink. He commands Timothy to drink wine. And I know our SBC friends may say, well, that wine was unfermented. There was no Welch's Corporation in antiquity. Unfermented wine was a grape. And the wine that Jesus used in John chapter 2 was the greatest wine that any of those people had ever tasted after they had already had too much. It's not a prescription, it's a narrative. It has a deep theological purpose, and I've taught on that. It means that a pastor can't give in to drunkenness to escape the stress of his calling. He has other things that he needs to do to do that. He cannot drink himself into peace because what, is, what does Paul tell the Ephesians? Do not be drunk, but what? Be filled with the Spirit. What defines drunkenness? We know. 
What did we do last night? I don't know. Me either. Huh? That was drunkenness. I mean, we don't have to get so technical with it. For some people, you shouldn't drink. But you can't say that a man can't have wine. You can't say that a man can't have alcoholic beverages. That's not okay. But at the same time, we don't have a church social and pull out a keg. I mean, you know, there's a context in which this stuff makes sense. Get the keg and the bandoliers, we've got a full house. I mean, you see, we're not catering to the culture. We live in the culture, but we do so in order, with order. And a pastor cannot be violent. This literally means cannot get into physical fights. He cannot be the guy that's known to pop one in the jaw just because he got in front of him at the McDonald's. Now, back in the 80s and 90s when I was coming up as a kid, we were getting in fights all the time. I got my butt handed to me on Smith Street twice, knocked out once. The dude spit in my hair. He was on a fence. I kicked the fence, knocked him off, <laughs> laughing, turned around, poop, he punched me in the head. I wake up with my buddies laughing over my body. That's what children do. We get into fights. I don't even know if y'all do that anymore. Fights today are like death sentences. I mean, we used to brawl and punch and kick and kung fu masters before we even had any kind of online training. I mean, you know, this was just watching Bruce Lee, much less a real teacher. Jiu-jitsu was WWF. I mean, you know, that was wrestling. <laughs> but a pastor cannot be getting into physical fights. People don't need to be scared of the pastor because he knocked the last deacon out. Did you hear about John and Judy? They were at a marriage counseling session and the pastor tumped the table over them, hit them in the head with it, and went hoorah. And I don't, and we, don't make him mad. I mean, that's not the character of a man of gentleness and humility and order. Do I want to do those things? They, they cross my mind once a year but must be gentle. That's the opposite of violent. In the direct context, it means able to back off, able to step down from conflict. A man who, possess, who doesn't press an issue, but possesses the wisdom and the common sense and the respectability and the orderliness and the humility to go, Lord Jesus, help me. And that's not blasphemy, that's a prayer. That is a prayer. Lord Jesus, help me. One of the simplest prayers I've ever learned to pray. Because you know what it feels like when you don't want to be gentle. A man who presses an issue is not fit to lead anyone in the household of faith because Scripture promises wisdom when one is impartial, patient, a learner, listening, so that they can get to the point of the matter. Not quarrelsome. I love this one. It's like my middle name when I was younger, quarrelsome. Sure is hot compared to what? Do you know how heat works? Let me tell you this. You know, I, I invented mansplaining just to make an argument. Not quarrelsome. An, order, an, an elder who is orderly cannot readily engage in disagreements. He doesn't need to look for disagreements. And when he disagrees, he needs to be gentle. He needs to go, I'm not going to take that fight today. I'll talk with that brother when we're having coffee, or I'll just let it go and watch and just teach. I don't even have to make a deal out of it. See, that's the order of the church. Anytime there's hostility or suspicion or frustration, that's all of Satan, folks. It's always of Satan, one million times over it's always negative it's always evil yet we know that God in his providence and sovereignty purposes it for his for his good for our good so we're not in despair but it doesn't mean that we don't put it in order and when people don't want to come to order they have to leave until they get orderly everyone must humbly submit to the instruction of Christ in a manner before any other, in, 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 in the right manner before any other discussion can be had. A seminarian, a philosopher, a debater, a theologian, a sophist, etc. are not qualified for see, overseeing God's people if they're not what? Gentle, patient, kind, etc. 
Those things don't qualify you. These things that we're talking about today qualify us. He must not be a lover of money. Now, what does that mean? A vow of poverty? Absolutely not. There are three places in the New Testament instruction where the church is told that a pastor must make his living according to the gospel. And beloved, I've tried. I've done all sorts of side jobs. I've tried to do other things. I've tried to take full-time teaching positions. And God just goes, this is so funny. Watch this. It's like your child getting through with like a three-week Lego project. Hey, Daddy, look. And you're just going, crash, stomp, stomp. Why did you do that, Father? <laughs> That's not your calling, boy. Not a lover of money. We know what that centers on, greed. Not entering the ministry because the salary at that church over there that you want is big. It's not about that. Scripture commands the flock to support the family, the pastor's family financially. But it cannot be his motivation. And oftentimes... People give based on their emotions and personal interest and how everything's going according to them instead of their service to the Lord. Elders cannot be motivated in this way. They cannot be motivated by greed but must be driven by the love of God's people. If people get benefit from the teaching of the elder, they should honor that benefit by giving. Now this one. Managing his own house. What in the world does that mean? Paul explains it. That he can lead his children in the same way that he's commanded to lead his church. You know what it doesn't mean? Beating your children into a sect of obedience. We're not a dog kennel. A household is not a dog kennel. We don't take the fly flap to the face or the wrench to the head. And that's a joke. Don't call the authorities. This literally means to be diligent before his family. That's what it means, to be diligent before his family. In other words, he leads his home just as he leads the church. What does that mean? Handling matters that arise, giving patient instruction, correcting when it's needed, without anger, without violence, but gentle. Teaching his children on matters of spiritual attitudes, not just requesting behavior. Teaching his children on issues of relationships, reconciliation. Children are going to act up when they're little, and they're going to act up worse when they're, when they're older. They're going to do it. And we sometimes, for those who spank or correct, it should not be punishment. It should be management. Punishing a child is not managing a household. Teaching and instruction with consequences is... And it is one of those things where we are able to teach our children according to the scripture. The question is, does the man allow his children to act out in rebellion? Does he let that go? Does he see his young child smart off at somebody and go, that's my son right there. Does he let the attitude of the teenager just act out in rebellion as if he doesn't care? Kids are going to do these things. And there's no other instruction here besides this. Any attempt to add anything to what it means to manage a household is adding to Scripture. Some people say, well, you know, you got to do this. The wife must be doing this. The kids must be doing this. This is what you ought to watch on TV. This is the type of radio you ought to have. This is the type of yard work needs to be handled. Your car's a little dirty. What about education? Homeschool, private school, public school, no school. These aren't in here. And to add to this is an abomination. It's an abuse of God's word to control God's people. The next thing, he should not be a new convert. We know this. But what does it mean? Two things. One is it means that he shouldn't be recently converted, time-wise. What is that time? Don't know. But more importantly is that conversion evidenced in maturity and spiritual wisdom. And these qualities are there. In other words, Paul's saying these qualities need to be grown and growing and intentional. They need to be aware of these things. In that same voice, I should not have been ordained and put into ministry when I was. 
I wasn't a recent convert, but I was not mature because I wasn't taught it. Matter of fact, I was praised for my aggression. Boy, Tippin slapped him in the head right there with what he said. Ooh. Man, he smashed my toes and all my foots and everything, you know? That's not, and the Bible tells me not to rebuke an older man, but to instruct him as I would my father. You know what I would do to my daddy? <laughs> Anything that would cause him to be upset. Because if he's called and placed, doesn't mean he's not called, but if he's placed before he's ready, before he's mature, before his time in the faith, he'll become puffed up. He'll become conceited. And he could fall into the condemnation of the devil. That means he'll make a mess. And it's very difficult to get an elder out of office, especially if he's the only one and he's made a mess of everything. So I'm going to tell you, other than absolute personal failure with most congregations, when you appoint an elder, it's a lifetime deal. If he's not submissive, to recognizing his disqualification and then sits on the front row while some other man teaches for a season so he can get these things right, you're stuck. He must be well thought of in the community by outsiders. You know what this implies? That he's outside. He's in the community. He's not myopic as in, in his interests. He's not just doing church stuff. See, that's one of the things, I don't even get on this, but I mean, look at the churches of our culture where instead of engaging and being a part of the, the culture and all the different things that we could do as human beings, they want to build their own stuff. Let's build our own league. Let's build our own stuff. Let's build our own school. Let's build all this. Let's do it all and keep everybody within the confines of church membership. That's not what the scripture teaches the church to be. I love it. <laughs> I'm not going to lie, it would be great. When I first got in the ministry, I thought, this would be great. Let's have 43 campuses over nine states. And everybody's required to go to this school. and everybody, It just it fits. It fits my obsessive nature to have order and everything's in its place or I'm insane, you know. But it's not biblical. An elder must have genuine relationships with unbelievers. A man who is able to have relationships with people outside the church can handle patiently when worldliness creeps up inside the church from the saints. Had a, a man some years ago stop us right there in the parking lot of, I don't even know if it was Walgreens then, gosh, this was 15 years ago or so. We were coming into town. He saw me, flagged me down, pulled in. He'd been having a hard time, had some illness. His wife was ill. He asked me to pray, and in that request for prayer, he used the Lord's name three times and the F word. And I'm going, no lie, seriously. And I'm like, okay, I'll pray, I'll pray for you. Most pastors, if they hear that stuff, would drive into the building trying to get away. Well, sir, I, I don't rightly know I can pray till you clean your mouth up. Come on, people. Come on, folks. See, an isolated person who doesn't understand the world out there and who's in it can't even do the work of an evangelist. We're not looking for clean people to bring into the church. We're calling for the elect of God to hear the words of Christ. And before God shows us the truth, we don't even know how nasty we really are. And we're not better than anybody. An elder must have genuine relationships with unbelievers, and those relationships must be equally respectable. As he's known by the people in the world, he should be known for his faith. He should be known for his gentleness, his reasonableness. He should be known for under being an understanding person, not a hard-hitting Bible thumper who tells everybody they're going to hell if they don't get straight. It's not even the gospel. When a pastor creates a vitriol reaction to the unchurched world because of his attitude, behavior, hatred, words, impatience, you, can better, you better believe he's going to do the same thing in the church. 
qualified man is engaged in his community. If he's not, with good respect, he's going to fall into disgrace and he's going to create a schism, the snare of the devil. So what else? What else? Well, we've got to review ourselves. We've got to, as elders, and for some of you who may be called and feel that you're called, disqualification comes and goes. The staying power of grace and maturity resolves all issues. Some things, obvious grievous acts of debauchery and illegal activity have to be addressed and they might have long-term consequences. But for the most part, generally speaking, every elder, elder already knows disqualifying issues every day of his life. We see them, we smell them, they're constantly there, they're biting us at our heels, they're weighing us down on our shoulders. But we address them. The qualified man addresses these things. He doesn't stand six years into the firmness of, I've done no wrong, no, I did wrong. That attitude I had, forgive me. Great. The church doesn't have the authority to bring a charge against the elder of the church. They bring the charges to the elders of the church privately. And the elders of the church, when they hear enough, they approach the elder for correction. Because talking about a pastor with anyone else is a serious sin. Just like talking about another brother or sister in the faith is a serious sin. If it is not building them up, it is a sin. Because the command to build up is there, and the command to not talk about people is there. So those two things rest in congruence. A pastor is a true disciple of Christ, a learner before a teacher. And it's not always the only gift he gives you, but it must be one that he has. Elders can serve in other places that they're equipped, not just teaching and oversight. But he cannot serve in other areas if it causes him to fail in teaching and oversight. Sometimes hobbies and interests and gifts. But all the elders are not going to be, to do, uh, be able to do everything. All the elders are going to be able to have the same gifts in every area of life. But they must all be able to have the gift of teaching in all wisdom. If they cannot teach the church and keep emotionalism out of the way... They need to take a closer to look to see if they're even called at the present time. But what do elders actually do? That'll be a couple of weeks. But in short, elders equip the body in order that the body may build itself. Did you hear that again? Where do I get that, Ephesians 4? Equip the body that the body may build itself. Elders aren't the builders of the body. The body builds itself. Elders equip the body and then keep everybody from killing each other in the process. And when everything goes sideways, they say, wait, the pastor, I mean, the, 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 the great shepherd has spoken, not me, the great shepherd has spoken, the true pastor has spoken, Jesus Christ our Lord, let's hear what he says in prescribing how we deal with this. Oh, first, everybody calm down. Second, everybody come together. Third, let's all pray. Fourth, let's be humble. This is 1 Timothy. That's what we've already learned in the last 27 weeks. Let's be humble. And then fourth, fifthly, let's put everything in order. Oh, listen to your elders, because this is how they're living and learning and growing. They have a lot to give you, because they're going through the same garbage exponentially, and God is bringing through this prescription the same resolve of unity and humility and peace for them. So watch them. And mimic them. Listen to them. For they will give an account for your joy and for your soul. We oversee the building of the church. The correction of the church. The training of the church. The growing of the church. No other person in the congregation has the authority or the responsibility of that. Isn't that a blessing? <laughs> And some of you might, well, I want it. Is it because you like being in control or do you have a call? And if you have a call, get ready for the ride because it's going to be a horrible ride with the greatest of outcomes. And some people say, well, I have a responsibility to my brother or sister. Yes, to serve them. 
And if you have intimate relationships, consensually speaking, in the context of, 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 of friendships and intimacy in the faith, then if someone in, intimately opens their life to you, then you have a responsibility to share the faith and to share the scripture and to teach one another how to handle the things of life. But we cannot go into people's lives like police officers investigating to see who's doing wrong. We don't have that authority, and we don't have the authority to say, you see so-and-so, you know so-and-so. That's sinful. That is murder. We can't have murder. But we need to see the body. Elders need to see that the body is learning and serving itself according to the gifts that God has given them. And, beloved, that's rarely taught because culture, history, tradition has overcome Clear, simple instruction. Jesus Christ has given his life for the church. And he leaves us in this earth that we may be together against all odds and against all differences in unity and humility. Because he is the picture of that humility where he gave himself a ransom for his people. So now we have an obligation to learn and to live out according to the Instruction given us by him through the apostles now overseen by the elders of the church. Oh my goodness, how easy is that? On paper, sounds pretty easy. Until you realize that on paper, the occasion for this instruction was pure chaos. So out of chaos, God separates and creates light from darkness. And out of chaos, out of sin, out of destruction, out of death... God the Son has saved the people and snatched them out of death and put them into himself. That when he died, we died. And when he lived, we live. So rest in that. Because we'll never get all this. We'll never do it right. We'll never be fully, completely, always qualified. But we are qualified, according to Paul's teaching in Colossians, we are qualified to inherit Righteousness and glory because we are counted in Christ. Perfect. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your undying love, for your eternal purposes, for your grace, and for your mercy. And as we take the table today, Father, I pray that you would help us to remember and realize exactly who we are. And what you've done to redeem us. And the fact that you've called us to be in this body together to live and to serve according to your purposes and to your prescription. And there are many people, Father, in, in the faith, brothers and sisters across our lives who do not agree with what you've written in your word. So, Father, help us to not be haughty and feel like we got it together because, Lord, just with your will, you could cause us to lose sight of these things. And so we thank you for your mercy. And we pray that you would show all of our brothers and sisters the truth of true peace beyond the gospel of redemption, but in this life as we wait for that day of glory. As we take this table, remember, help us to remember to what end and to what cause for your namesake that we sit here today. In Christ Jesus we pray. Amen.